entered the corporate world with a dream of becoming the go-to guru, the guy whose forecast was right year after year after year. Uh, well, that bus left without me. And he thanked me for the lesson. Actually, he rolled his eyes. Um, he is a teenager, he's 15 years old. Uh, but I have developed this theory that when a teenager rolls his or her eyes, that is merely the kid's way of saying, thanks for being a good parent. You know, I used to think that I would uh, come into an audience and if I were optimistic, the audience would leave optimistic, but if I were pessimistic, the audience would leave pessimistic. Well, I decided that doesn't happen at all. You walked in the door either optimistic or pessimistic, and you're going to go out optimistic or pessimistic, pretty much regardless of what I say. And if you're not sure where you are, if you're one of the sales guys, you're an optimist. If you're a finance guy, you're a pessimist. And How many people listened to the president do his inauguration speech? Okay, so I don't have to worry about you having listened to that. <laughs> I, didn't listen, I didn't listen to it either. <sighs> I read the synopsis in the Wall Street Journal, and that's good enough for me. But people look at those forecast numbers, and they say, Bill, Bill, Bill. You know you're going to get slapped in the face when somebody says your name three times. Bill, Bill, Bill. Yes, and what great service he gets from, from FCS. So walking down the street, not paying attention to where he's going, and because he's not watching, he suddenly falls down into a 10-foot hole. Now, I as an economist, watching a person fall into a 10-foot hole, I say, ah, he's in recession. I'm not going to help him, I'm just an observer. You ever get that comment on your report card? Bill does not work up to his potential. Second grade, fifth grade, I finish my doctoral dissertation, and one of my advisors says, Bill, you just barely got by, you know, not working up to your potential. Well, the economy is not working up to its potential. Uh, is to eat out less often. What does that do to the demand for food? Not much, not much. Maybe there's a little bit more wastage in the restaurant world than at home. Um, but, I, you know, I live with somebody who, if we have uh, two spoonfuls of leftover mashed potatoes, it's going in the Tupperware in the refrigerator, and it's staying until it gets green. Although I've got to uh, confess that uh, I uh, admire the approach that Zig Ziglar took. He was the great motivational speaker who passed away last year. He said that uh, uh, he starts every morning by reading the Bible and the newspaper so that he has both sides of the story. Um, Everybody is different. When I was uh, 18, my buddy John Bentley and I, we uh, double dated with a set of identical twins. But you know, by the third date, I realized those two girls were different from one another. It took three dates and a slap in the face, but I learned. Journalism. Journalism class. The best class I took. Actually, it's not the best class I took. The most useful class. The best class I took was algebra because I got to sit next to Terry Henley, uh, which at age 13 was about as much a joy as a boy could imagine. But uh, let's not get into that. Uh, I started my career uh, doing economic forecasting of GDP, and I'd round to the nearest billion, and I just got into the habit. My wife would say, Bill, is the checkbook balanced? And I'd say, yeah, to the nearest billion. We got zero. Um, now, she is a, an eye surgeon, an ophthalmologist, and she does eye surgery. And she has this notion in her head that an error of one millimeter means that somebody goes blind. And I've got this notion in my head that, oh, it's a billion more, a billion less. It's all, you know, it's all in the ballpark. <clears throat> so this combination of a family where somebody thinks millimeters are crucial and somebody thinks billions and trillions are just sort of ballpark numbers, uh, the net result is we cannot agree on furniture. I had a dream a while back had a dream a couple of weeks ago. I dreamt I was uh, sailing my boat, and through a navigational error, I ended up washing ashore on a remote tropical island. So visualize white sandy beaches and palm trees swaying in the breeze. Uh, there are parts of this dream I cannot share with you this morning. Uh, <laughs> but when the village chieftain learned an economist had washed up on shore, he comes, a big stout guy, comes, um, 
a short, stout guy, uh, waddling down and says, Dr. Bill, Dr. Bill, you have to help us because the, the grass hut market is really lousy here. They all lived in grass huts. And the chief explained to me that the fellows who thatched the grass uh, roofs were out of work and that the price of grass huts was going down. And we're strolling through the village, and he says, uh, tell me what to do. I'm thinking about maybe regulating the guys who lend clams for the purchase of grass huts or maybe starting a federal national grass hut mortgage association. What do you think I ought to do? And uh, as we have been strolling through the village, I have counted 100 families, 110 grass huts. And I'm thinking, what's the solution here? I'm a smart guy. Is there a new loan product? Is there a new regulation? Is there financial engineering that solves the problem of 100 families, 110 grass huts? And finally, I said, Chief, do you guys know how to use fire? <laughs> so that's the end of the dream. Let's get back to reality. Here in the United States, we do not use fire to get rid of excess housing outside the city of Detroit. You can send me an email. Just please mention you are at the BOMA Boise event so I can separate your email from the groupies and stalkers who so bedevil handsome young economists.